I am thrilled to be joined by colleagues at UIUC who will talk about their Mellon-funded project on linked open data and special collections. Tim Cole will kick things off and will introduce the other speakers as well as other people who are engaged in the project. For those of you who have not yet had the pleasure of meeting Tim, his voice at times can be a little difficult to hear, but he'll go slowly and I assure you that there's no, there's no technical problem um, with, your, with your sound system. So Tim, it's uh, ready to turn things over to you. Take it away. Thank you, Marilee. Um, yeah, I'm here in the room with um, my colleagues, Jacob Jett, who will be doing a large portion of the presentation in a few minutes. Uh, MJ Hong, who will also be um, helping and helping with questions as we go along. Um, to be clear before I begin, this is very much a work in progress. This is a relatively new project for us. We got underway right at the end of last year. We're only about a third of the way, actually a little less than a third of the way into the project. Um, so the results that we'll talk about today are very preliminary and subject to change. But I hope they'll provoke some discussion, some ideas, some comments so we can have a, a useful hour. In terms of what we're going to cover, um, I'm going to basically give a brief overview of the project, a little about its rationale, how we're approaching this topic, uh, some of the research questions, and then turn it over to Jacob um, to talk about the work that he and MJ have done um, in a very concrete sense, mapping some of our special collection metadata into um, linked open data uh, into the resource description framework to make it useful for linked open data. We'll talk about the entities that are described in our metadata, <clears throat> how we're using uh, schema.org semantics, how we're beginning to do some testing with the uh, Google Structure Data Tool, and some of the issues that we've encountered so far. And I'll come back at the end and talk a little bit about preliminary ideas for enhancing uh, UI functionality, user interface functionality, um, by using the links and other media enrichment that we're doing. Uh -oh. So the title of the project, as Marilee said, is Exploring the Benefits for Users of Linked Open Data for digitized special collections. The rationale is pretty straightforward. Um, I've been involved here more than two decades now in various um, uh, digital library projects. We've done a lot of digitization over that time. We focused a lot on digitizing our special collections from our Rebel Manuscript Library and elsewhere in the library. And we've seen those digitized special collections being used in increasing amount, um, especially in digital humanities, scholarship, and teaching. But we still tend to be somewhat siloed in our approaches. So beyond digitizing our special collections, what more do we need to do to maximize the usefulness of these collections? As Marilee mentioned, um, this project is supported in large part by a 20-month research grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And we want to thank them for their support and for their help in structuring and designing this project. The questions we posed in our research project are application to Mellon. There were four main questions. So what additional challenges are encountered when we transform legacy special collections metadata records into a more linked open data friendly structure? Having done that, do we see ways of linked open data can actually help libraries get away from the style of collections and in particular reconnect our digital special collections with our general collections? Frequently, as you'll see in our discussion in a minute about the specifics, we have content that's special like images um, associated with theater, which connect directly to plays 
and other kinds of materials that we have in our general collection, but there aren't connections right now, um, the easy connections from our digital collect special collections to our online books and even our print books in our catalog. So can linked open data help us do better that? Can linked open data help us bring more context um, to the displays we present our users about our special collections content? And can we help identify links um, to both library and non-library resources on the web that our users of our digitized special collections would appreciate? And then we want to look in particular for one of our collections at visualization and annotation, and annotation technologies. In particular, we're going to look at a social network view of one of our special collections and see if that complements more traditional bibliographic, bibliocentric perspective and add value to that collection. And you understand more about that in a minute. The project team here at Illinois, uh, I'm the principal investigator, but I'm helped uh, on this a great deal by MJ and Caroline Silowitz, who's in our rare book library. Uh, Caroline Stradwin couldn't be here today. And then we have a postdoc from the library school, Peter Ryanishak, um, who is working with us. We have a developer, Janina Nassero, um, who has worked with us on a number of projects, a project coordinator, we have two PhD students who have worked on the project thus far, Jacob, who you hear from in a minute, and Katrina Fenlon. We have some other graduate assistants from the library school, uh, Alex Kinnaman and Melina Zavale. Um, and I should mention this is a collaboration very much between the, the library and the Center for Informatics Research in Science and Scholarship, which is part of the library school here, the high school here at Illinois. The collections we chose for this um, experiment, for this research, we chose three of our collections. Um, the Motley Collection of Costume and Theater Design is basically images of um, theater set designs and costume designs done by the Motley Group in the mid-20th century. We have another collection of images, sketches, artwork that were portraits of actors in costume um, over about 200 year period, um, about 4,000 more items there. There's 7,000 or 6,000 items in Motley almost. Yes, 4,600. Okay. And uh, we also have a special archive that's very text based. These are essentially notes that Phil Kolb, Professor Phil Kolb, took on the life and times of Marcel Proust, um, including both his letters and his works. They elaborate on information like the Reverend Neem references in his letters, the event references. They talk about newspaper articles that co-located Marcel Proust with others in a circle and that sort of things. They include a name authority file of almost 7,000 names um, connected in one way or another to Marcel Proust. These three collections were selected because they provide well curated special collections of metadata, typical of what you see in special collections these days. They have both image and text using two different systems, ContentDM and XTF, the Extensible Text Framework from uh, the California Digital Library. The metadata includes people, places, events, and there are lots of resources on the web that relate to these collections. The breakdown of how we're approaching this work, we broke our, task, our work down into four tasks. And we're pretty much still working on task one and two. Um, I'll show you a little more about, or Jacob will, about what we've done there. So the first task has been how do we transform this metadata into linked open data. We're applying schema.org semantics for this project. We're identifying along the way some potential extensions. We're doing some work to improve the existing metadata. We find that in spite of our best attentions, the authority control is not always as good as we think it should be. Um, 
We're using both automated and manual methods to add links that add context to the metadata descriptions. We're enriching with these links and enhancing discovery, as I mentioned, improving authority control. And one of the reasons we're using schema.org is for search engine friendly descriptions. We're also expecting this linked open data version of the metadata to support more informative displays um, for the user that are better connected to library and non-library resources. And we're beginning to think now about what those user interface displays and functions will look like, and we have some mockups to show you toward the end here today. And then our last project is taking that 7,000 main database and thinking about how to present that graphically, visually, as a social network of sorts to users, and then allowing users to annotate that social network. So for example, Marcel Proust appears in connection with many individuals who had opinions or positions on the Dreyfus Affair that took place in France about 100 years ago. But what we don't know from the existing metadata we have is on which side of the Dreyfus issue the individuals were involved. So there can be mentioned in an article in Figaro that Proust was at an event with so-and-so, Madam X or whatever, but you don't know whether Madam X was his enemy or his friend. And we're hoping to use annotation as a way to improve our understanding of the edges of the graph. So we understand better, um, yes, this is a colleague, this is a friend, this is a familial person, this is an enemy on this particular issue, uh, or whatever. We're going to move into some concrete examples. And I'll show these two slides before turning it over to Jacob. This is a content DM display of one of the items in our Motley collection. It's some very simple sketches for a couple of costumes that appear in a particular play. And below it, you see the description. We've looked at that description. This is the description the way it appears in content DM. And we looked at that description and thought about how we can improve it and how we can enrich it with links and we've begun doing that process, and then turn into a search engine friendly format using RDFA, Resource Description Framework, embedded in um, uh, HTML, and then show this, um, not only to show it to users, but also to allow behind the scenes more to happen. And then we turn it over to Jacob and just find the new events. Okay. Um... So uh, I'm going to talk about how we've uh, mapped this content DM display into uh, schema.org's metadata schema. We applied some central design principles um, uh, that we believe are important for linking metadata to the web. Um, Want to use RDF-based standards. Link data is kind of built around them. Um, we selected schema.org vocabulary out of other uh, choices we could have made, like BibFrame, um, because it's already being used by OCLC, uh, and it's already also being used by web search engines. Um, we also found it expressive enough to preserve the existing metadata that we have in our content DM records. Um, transforming strings, uh, some of the strings in the metadata into URIs, uh, with a special focus on Upgrading uh, people's names and organizational names uh, with BIAF identifiers, um, so it's easy to go and find more information uh, from the web about them. Uh, we're using Library of Congress geo identifiers for places, uh, and we will soon be using uh, Library of Congress uh, subject heading SCOS concepts. That's the Library of Congress's linked data for subject headings, uh, and the Getty. Uh, the sources linked open data vocabularies for some of the subject headings. Um, we also wanted to exercise some good linked data practices, uh, one of which was to disambiguate the entities that are described in the Dublin Core records. As you're going to see on the next slide, um, more, more is being described in Content DM than just that sketch. And we also want to facilitate the reuse of the metadata in outside contexts. Um, so again, we have this sketch uh, with all this metadata. It's kind of microscopic on this slide. Um, 
But what all that metadata is really uh, describing is not just that sketch. Um, like if you go back to, was it slide 11 that has the better view of the metadata that's below? Uh, or we could advance one. Like if, so if you read through this metadata description, you see there's actually quite a bit about when this play was performed. Right, it opens in 1967, takes place at this theater, um, right? It tells you what the play is, The Unknown Soldier and His Wife, who is the author of the play. So there's more information here. If we go back one slide, there's more information than just the costume designed by Motley. Um, so one of the things we want to do with linked data descriptions so that the web browsers don't get confused when they read the metadata is kind of delineate which portions of the metadata are talking about which entity, right? Separate it by costume design, stage production, and the play. Uh, we can skip ahead. Um, so the first, our first task was identifying which metadata is actually describing the costume sketch. Uh, and here on this slide, I've highlighted all the sections. As you see, the majority of the record is indeed about this costume sketch. We have the name. Uh, 1914 Sergeant and Grocer. It tells you what kind of costumes and what characters are going to be using them. Who the design was by, it's Motley um, group. Um, what kind of thing it is, kind of traditional library descriptions of it, size, how it was made, um, some topical headings, rights information, where it's being held. It's part of our Motley collection of theater costume design here. Um, and there's this alternative JPEG image. We want a high, uh, high resolution image of it. Um, we advance one. Uh, so here we're looking at the actual mapping of those highlighted sections of the, of the content DM into schema.org. What we found is um, schema.org has a pretty good uh, hierarchy of creative works. Uh, we found one uh, that matched what the sketch is um, conceptually as a visual artwork. Um, we just kind of mapped every all, all the rest of these headings kind of naturally into the places uh, we think they would go to. Image title is a name. Um, it was designed by its creator, in this case an organization, and for the special collection, always Motley. Um, what kind of uh, thing that it is, it's an art form, uh, what materials and techniques were used, it's art medium, dimensions, uh, schema has a concept of dimensions, um, which you would expect because it's being used by certain booksellers. Um, we've kind of merged these three different subject headings into one predicate, schema about. Um, They'll be managed through using three different vocabularies that plug into it. Um, rights, copyright holder, physical location is the provider. Um, we've had to extend schema.org. You'll see uh, there's an inventory number that does not actually map to schema. Schema doesn't actually have a concept of um, specialized uh, institutional level inventory numbers. Um, so we've had to add that ourselves. We go ahead and advance a slide. So here we have the highlighted sections of this content in metadata record that actually describes stage production. One of the things uh, that always leaps out to me is the notes section. The notes section doesn't say anything about that costume sketch at all. It provides a great deal of inf information about the stage production that it was a part of kind of which uh, cities did, were um, performances of this play uh, had and um, like who, who, yes, like some alternatives, uh, points at some alternative costume designs that were also used for those characters. Um, let me go ahead and advance to the, the scheme mapping. Um, so here's one of the important factors. Uh, schema.org does not have uh, an idea of plays, does not have an idea of things that happen on stages uh, like Bill. So we have to map it into schema's creative work, which is kind of the overarching work level. Um, 
we've gone ahead and added an additional type, which we call a stage work. Um, and then kind of the rest of the mapping is pretty much as you would expect it. Uh, production has a title, which we map to a name. Um, there's a certain theater that it was first developed at, that's the location created. There's an opening performance date, which is the date created uh, with the notes. So in response to the question from Stephen, I think, about um, uh, how much to put in, we don't try to put in all the information for the stage production, but we're dealing with the legacy record. They had some information about it. And obviously, for search and discovery, you want your system to have some information uh, available locally to facilitate and make performance of your system good. Um, you'll see in a minute that there's more that's not in the records. So we drew the line here very simply based on what the legacy was, what kind of information about the state perform state work, the performance as a as a um, not the individual performance but the production. Um, the previous curators put in, um, and then let's find the right place to put that in the description. <clears throat> we have the other problem, which is as you connect to outside resources, you're tempted to bring more in. So far, we've tried to limit that for the most part, but we may in fact do that a little bit because it may facilitate discovery. We have some other systems where we tried to discovery where the discovery process itself is a little bit distributed, uh, especially with controlled vocabularies, you can actually do that, but there's some limitations on it. So, um, again, we do link in the next piece. We link to the play, the bibliographic item, and we do primarily rely on what's in our catalog at that point and not try to um, expand that one. The production as such is a bit different because it's not something that libraries being there's not necessarily a, a book for it as a production, not as a play, but as a production. It kind of does fall in the crack a little bit. But let's actually look on the next slide here if I can get our budget to work. Right. Um, so as Tim was saying, um, stage production itself is kind of a adaptation or example of a published work. Um, in the content PM records, there is a little information about that work, just highlighted here, The Unknown Soldier and His Wife, the 1967 play by Peter Usinoff. Uh, if we go ahead and advance the slide. Again, um, we don't want to recreate information you can get out of our library catalog. Just wanted to map what is there in Content DM, which is what is happening here. Um, so most of those plays are published actually as books. Uh, so we've mapped the play itself to a schema book type. Um, that isn't very specific because the book could be a novel, could be a nonfiction book. Um, so we've gone ahead and added an additional type using the SPAR vocabularies. Uh, can we batch edit and match to schema? That would actually be kind of a Janina question. Well, we are doing some of that, in yes. fact. Yeah, I mean, the, the mappings that Jacob's showing are not applied manually for the most part. They're mostly applied uh, by automated processes. Let's, uh, let's get to the, the Google display here, because it'll show sure. a little better. Um, so uh, in this next slide, what we're seeing is uh, on the left, well, the whole thing is this Google structured data testing tool. So once you've uh, embedded RDFA into your uh, web pages, in this case our Conti NTM page, um, you can plug it into this Google Structured Data Testing tool, and uh, Google will tell you what information it can actually learn from your web page. So on the left is the HTML markup, and if folks are really interested in diving into that, we can um, share our screen later after we're done with this portion of the presentation and kind of look at it more live. On the right is information that's being gleaned by your browser. Um, and here we have a close-up uh, highlighted, the, the part of it that describes the visual artwork. There's actually more information, but it's way down at the bottom about the visual artwork. We go ahead and advance. But note here we've added a, um, 
a handle using our local handle server to identify persistently this particular artwork, we found that the most consistent best way to do this because even if we move the object out of content TM at some point in time, we'll still have that handle. That's very important in the linked data world to have some place that people can always find your research. Actually, that's a really good point. Can you click back? Um, so you can also see where we have added the VIAF identifier for Motley, right? So you can see exactly where the linked data is being inserted. Um, so if we advance, Um, I think that's a question of the host, but yeah, the slides will be shared. Slides will be available on our website as well. Um, okay, so we're on slide 23, um, and here we're looking at the metadata that describes that stage work. Um, we've actually been able to enrich it quite a quite a large amount with links. So there's a DBpedia page that actually describes the stage production. Um, there's also a web page on the Internet Broadway database that describes this production. We'll show that in a minute. Um, and uh, there's some alternative names for when this production went to France. Uh, and here we have the linked data that describes the actual play. So, of course, being a bibliographic item, uh, there's a link to WorldCat. Can retrieve a lot more information about it uh, and its published version from WorldCat. Um, and we've added the BAF identifier for the author. Um, and from the WorldCat record, we went ahead and took the um, information about the book series. That was not in the record previously. We automatically just grabbed that as part of our analysis. A of little value add. WorldCat. Okay, so uh, you've seen the examples. Um, we're, going to, we're going to look more what this means for the user, but first let's talk about some of the metadata issues encountered. Right. So it seems like it was an easy mapping. A lot of things are kind of one to one if you compare the mapping to what's displayed in Content DM. However, uh, ran into more than a few hiccups. Um, there's ambiguity in some of the Content DM field names. So author and composer is all uh, often concatenated. Um, so it's not always clear to us what role a person was actually playing. Did they make the music for the play or did they write the play? Um, some of the places and people went through name changes. Um, it's particularly true for the theaters where the plays are performed at. At the time the play was made, um, what is now Her Majesty's Theater was the King's Theater in London. Similarly, what is now the Royal Shakespeare Theater, um, when it was first built, it was called the Shakespeare Memorial Theater. Um, we did decide what uh, what metadata should be linked, and not all metadata is for discovery and access. If you were to compare the before and after um, views of the CONTM screens, you'll notice, especially in the notes field, there are many, many fewer links. It's because CONTENTDM likes to just search on strings. So we'll try and search on every permutation in your metadata record. And we wanted to kind of limit that to only searches that were going to be useful. I think content DM. Sure, you can do what you want in the in the um, uh, in content DM, but there are some issues in how this was done originally. Dublin Core doesn't necessarily make it easy, and you have to add your extensions. Not everybody does it the same way. In this case. What the people doing this collection originally digitized more than a decade ago did was they took all the names they knew about and just concatenated them with semicolons between them. We're using code to separate them out. Sometimes they put in parentheses the role, sometimes they didn't. So we're cleaning the metadata up and trying to add that where we can. That's manual labor. Special Collections has a lot of manual labor, so we're willing to spend it on it. But it's one of those trade-offs that you have to make. So again, these are things that kind of weren't anticipated. Just having the name there was good enough. But now if I want to know more about what role this person played on this particular item, that, that becomes more complicated. 
Right. The leg legacy metadata. I mean, so part of that is um, there, are, there are certain things that human beings are really good at, right? If I were to look at the metadata record, I could probably figure out without too much trouble who the author and composer is. But machines cannot navigate that. Um, some of the other issues. Um, so one of the big issues with the schema.org vocabulary and our our desire to describe the, the stage production. As we mentioned, there's no there's no stage work um, that is attached to the creative work hierarchy. Um, what schema.org does have is something called a theater event. The thing is that theater events are particular to certain performances of plays. Um, so they have things like um, who was lead actor? Um, did take place? Who was the understudy for how that much, particular performance? Um, how, much how many did, people attended? How much the tickets cost? What it's going to be? Remember, scheme that work is is heavily commercial in its orientation. So a theater that in to Google in the schema that work is often present tense or future tense. It's not the kind of event that somebody wants to sell tickets to. Whereas obviously we're dealing with performances of 50 years ago, so it's a little different, right? And our content, our content, the metadata doesn't actually describe anything at that granularity level, right? Just the overarching, of a stage sketch that was used for production, which was used for multiple performances. Um, but also, like as we already pointed out, uh, there's also no creative work subclass that represents plays. The best we have is a book. Um, but oddly, schema.org does have this notion of TV episodes and episodes, which have a lot of these um, properties that stage productions have, like directors, actors, characters, costume and set designers, all of these things. And episodes and TV episodes are creative works. Um, so we're left kind of wondering, um, should we propose stage work as a new subclass of creative work to schema community? And in fact, I think if any of you are on their mailing list, um, there has been such a proposal put forward, not just by us. Uh, there's a digital library in France that's put forward one. Yeah, we're very familiar with the European data model, and we have looked at that, but it's got some other things it's focused on, and it's not as well understood by the um, uh, search engines right now. So once you get the data into linked open data, moving it among different semantic sets is a little easier um, once you make the initial cut. So we'll think about it. Let me, let's yes, go to the slides here real quick and then we'll come back to questions. Because it we're at the half an hour and I want to get through a couple more things before we finish. An important focus though it's one thing to do this in order to make your content more visible to Google and Yahoo and Bing. It's another thing to want to do this to make the content more useful and provide context to users of your collections. So this is the mock-up. This is not a live display yet. This is the mock-up. The right-hand sections of it, um, basically the text there in the description, the image of the placeholder above for a an image area where you can view and expand and shrink the image. Um, these are what's currently available in Content DM. We've added some additional things here. You'll see the magnifying glass. I'll show these in just a minute in the description. But this is essentially what we have locally. On the, on the left-hand side of the page, these little boxes, our goal is to generate these dynamically as we bring the display up to the user, taking advantage of the links. So for example, um, I'll show you in a second here. Because we have links, or we have information in the current metadata, we can say if you want more information about this, you can go to DBpedia. Uh, and there's a link to DBpedia here. Or if you want more information about the play on the left-hand side, we would include a link, it's not there right now, but it will be to the Internet Broadway database because the first performance of this play was in New York. Um, and here you have now more information about when the play opened to that theater, when it closed, 
the various people involved, including the director, which is not in our content DM record, but is there if people want more context about it and want to follow breadcrumbs. Um, the one question that we're still thinking about is how much of this do we bring back in to our displays and potentially even into our indexing. Here's the DVP entry about Peter Ustinov. If you want to know more about him, I have additional links. That's the second box on the left-hand side of the page. So that's just to give you a sense of, of where we're heading. We want to, we've, we've done some preliminary user testing in the existing systems. Some observations from that testing suggest that people are kind of like, well, I want to know more about this. And right now, the links that are in the system are all internal. They don't go outside. So we want to add links that will take people outside, displays that bring in more information and provide them context. So people can say, oh, okay, that's interesting. This director worked with Peter Ustinov on this play. He also worked with Peter Ustinov on another play that I know about. The other thing we discovered by happenstance is that many of the set designs um, in our Motley collection, there are photographs of those as they were realized in productions in the Harvard Theater collection. There's no connection now between those two. So as we are able to discover those connections, we want to add them to the links, and I want users to help us add um, to the links through annotation so that we can um, bring additional things in uh, and let people see additional context and go from sketch to photograph. Does that make sense? So we're going to get into questions now. Can you elaborate on the procedure for plugging in and get into content DM? So here's the way we're doing it right now. Um, we're taking the metadata and dumping it out of content DM, and massaging it in the spreadsheet. Um, separating entities where we can, adding links where we can, and then programmatically reassembling that back into um, XML. And our intention is to increase the number of fields that we have in our content DM metadata scheme, put some connections in where we have to bind a URL, for example, to a name. We'll bind that within the same content DM field with a special delimiter. And then we'll inject the into the content display JavaScript. There's a place where you can do that. And that JavaScript will uh, basically pull up in lieu of the content DM version of the display a special prepared version um, with the RDFA embedded. And that will replace it on the screen for the user if they have JavaScript enabled in the browser. If they don't, they just get the original content DM with some extra URLs buried in the content, but not, not especially helpful. But we can overlay this. So the, the current thinking with the current version of content DM is it continues to be our search engine, our place, our place where we hold the content, including the images that we hold locally but that when we present it to the user, we're basically going beyond the content DM. And when they get to the detailed record, what they're seeing is our re refactoring of the content DM display into our display with the additional dynamically created um, folders. We have to have extra services running on the same server as content DM. We demonstrate that's possible. So we've done this all in proof of concept. It'll be a challenge over the next six months to make that work. And we'll see how it goes. Hope that's a little bit helpful. By the end of the project, we may in fact have some software, some JavaScript modules, some other um, pre-coordinated things you can do, and some services packaged up that would work well with Content TM, the version we're currently operating with. We're hoping, of course, that Content TM will put more things, hooks for this into the next release, and then we won't have to be quite as hacking as we're going to be doing for this project. So, yes, actually, I think so. Um, 
not to be too particular with your question. The date created, uh, the date when the play was written is part of that block of metadata that describes the play. Um, we're going to go back a few slides to, I don't know, which slide could that be? Maybe 17? Here's a basic display. Oh, yes. So this is good. Um, so you notice where it says published work and how there's a date right after the title of that work. That would be the date the play was written. However, um, you have a good point. This, the stage production creation date is not probably the same as the opening performance date. Right? In this case, because it only provides years, it looks like the same. Um, but also, uh, we're a bit limited because this is a le uh, legacy metadata. Um, so it has that particular um, description tag in the content DM display uh, and the, the granularity of the date being given is an entire year. Um, their opening performance date is usually a particular night. And in fact, what we would anticipate doing, you know, in an additional round of metadata enhancement is probably improving that date with one link data resources. The Internet Broadway database, for example, did have an exact night. So the content DM fields that are already, we can just simply update it with the value if we think the resource is authoritative enough. Yes. The other thing is the note that's, again, not, it's inferred for humans, not clear to the machine. The performances in Lyon, London, and Stratford, 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 Connecticut, were done in subsequent years. And again, we could associate with those event dates, especially if we treated them like theater events. Um, let's see. How much of the enhancement data will can be shared with made score by aggregators? The currently we provide our content game collection metadata to DPA through OI, uh, the content game OAI services. So it is not going to be shared with the DPA day soon. But I understand that DPAA has its own workflows to enhance those names and places and events metadata with URIs in their end. So we can discuss in two ways in this one. So whether we can uh, implement the link layer portion of the data into content MOI service and how DPAA is working to improve uh, metadata with uh, strings to URIs. So European, I mean, uh, DPLA has a internal RDF-based format that's based largely in large part on Europeana's data model. Um, at this point, they're not ingesting that format directly as we understand it. Right. We've had conversations, that's something they're thinking about. They may be experimenting with it, I'm not aware. I haven't talked to them for a while about this. Um, if they get to the point where they could accept that, then we would want to map our schema.org data into the European data model, um, all of that is needed, and send them that directly if we could. Right now, we're pretty much limited to kind of double core with yeah. some extensions. Double core for DPA day, for sure. Right. Um, the next question was the URLs. So we're doing a couple of different things. As I mentioned, because this is a special collection with a limited number of records, and some records have things in common, like the note field for that performance is the same across all costume and set designs in our database for that particular play. Um, we're manually touching the metadata. And in the process of cleaning it up, the graduate students who are doing this are finding some links and they're adding those links directly. We also are doing some automated looks in BIF. We found for BIF, when we have to do this many calls, that's useful to download one of the snapshots and then look at locally. Otherwise, we make too many calls too fast against VIF, and we don't want to run a follow of governors that shut us down. I know they're still doing that, but they did that a couple of years ago. Um, there, we're using fairly simple heuristics at this point to find maps. Now, there have been some advanced work. There's some people looking at the Levenstein distances for better matches. We're basically relying on exact matches. If we put the name in in the right order, and we get an exact single match, 
in VIF, we take it. If we do it and we get multiple matches and there's no differentiation available by date, we don't take it. The result is not all of our records will end up having VIF links for all the names. The other thing, of course, is we have a lot of people who aren't authors. They're not in VIF. They may be in McKinney um, Wulam. They may be in other databases. In the case of Proust, a lot of the names, only about a third of the names, are in VIF, as best we can tell, because many people are not connected to literary endeavors. So we're seeing them in databases of the World War I veterans of France. So we're finding some interesting things. A name is mentioned in Proust's letters in 1913, 1914, 1915, and then suddenly never mentioned again. And we discover the person was killed in action in 1915. So now we know why. Um, those kind of things are very interesting by doing this. We don't have a good time estimate to give you yet because we haven't finished all the cleaning. But um, I don't know how long Alex and Melina have been doing this. This has been a big chunk of their work, you know, last 10 weeks. So they've each at least hired hours. And um, you and Caroline have spent time. So data cleanup and mapping those uh, metadata, local metadata field to the schema that group semantics are completely two different things we have learned. And initially we thought that mapping from Dublin Core, uh, our uh, metadata field to schema that group semantics uh, was not that hard. But we have learned that it is complicated more than we have anticipated. So it's taking a long time. We're going to come up with some estimates, and we won't finish all the cleanup we like to do. Yeah. But we will get some. And again, given the amount of work that's gone to making this metadata in the first place, it's it's going to be a fraction of that that we do this time around, and we can anticipate it'll need to be done again in a couple of years and so on. That's kind of the case with special collections metadata. Let me answer the next question. Um, so we're not pulling all the one data into our system for indexing. We're trying to make decisions about what little bits might be useful. We also have triple source, which allow us to look things up by URIs very quickly. And in another project, and we're hoping to adapt for this, where we have control vocabularies, we found it kind of useful to do a kind of a simultaneous search. It's not, strictly speaking, a meta search, but for example, we have a database of Renaissance era material, which the images have been indexed using icon class. Icon class vocabulary, about 30,000 terms, is available in four languages currently. We didn't want to recreate that database here, so we actually send the query when people are querying on subject aids, on descriptors, we send the words they send and the language they tell us to the icon class service in the Netherlands. It gives us back a list of URIs that are most likely matches in their vocabulary. We then check those URIs in our system as part of our search. We allow people to combine this search with keyword searches of the model transcriptions, for example, so they can do a search for certain words in the motto and certain words appearing in the icon class descriptor, and they'll get back results. And the performance for that system has been acceptable. Again, we're dealing with something that has less than 50,000 items in it. Um, but it actually surprised us how efficient that turned out to be. Long term, we hope to see services moving in this direction where you can connect links pretty quickly if you can do that. So, Michael, if I added that, as Jacob mentioned in his presentation, if we are going to use schema of semant semantics for directors or custom designer or something, it's very clearly, and if that is available in our metadata, and, and then the search for specific roles for specific players and specific person can be done really easily. So that is a matter of how we are going to use the schema dialogue semantics and whether the uh, schema dialogue community is going to adopt our uh, proposal. Yeah. And like I say, we'll bring some information in as we find it, but we don't want to recreate the entire linked data web. That's not, yeah. not the goal.
This is Marilee. I don't see any questions at the moment, um, but I do have my own question for you, which is can you talk about the types of tools that you're using in this project that you find to be um, kind of the most useful in doing this work and what types of tools you wish existed? If you had a magic wand and could wave it, what tool would magically appear to make your lives easier? So in terms of making sure we're doing the um, construction of the RDFA correctly, there are a number of tools we use. Oxygen for editing our HTML pages. You can also be used for editing JSON, which is handy. Um, and then we run our RDFA, as you saw, against both the structured data tool from Google and also against both the RDFA distiller that W3C makes available and against the uh, RDFA or the RDF translator. That allows us to move around in different formats. Um, there's not exactly real good schema validation of RDF at this point, although there is work coming out of W3C on something called shapes, which is probably going to help that if it gets all the way through to a formal recommendation. Um, and then the other thing we're doing is taking advantage of linked data tools that allow us to discover things. So DIF is pretty good. Um, you can throw things against it and discover things and get persistent URIs quite easily. The data is made available in multiple formats. There's a human readable display, but also behind the scenes there are JSON and RDF XML displays. The RDF XML display is available in MARC format and then a couple other formats. Um, and then if you follow the links within VIF to national libraries like BNF, the French National Library, you can find um, linked data services they put up. Um, the German National Bibliography is very nice because they add additional information like occupation of authors and so on, which can be kind of interesting for enrichment. Um, so that's been good. Some databases like the Internet Bravo database does not have linked data capability yet. So there we're relying on their consistency and persistence. And we could lose out if they start changing their URLs on us. That's a risk you take in this space. Um, we're using Refine, Google Open Refine, to um, look at some of our metadata and help make sense of it. One of the problems we found in Code Proust is that the same periodical name, um, Figaro, for example, might be in the data 10 different ways, or in some cases, 50 different ways for some of the more complex titles. So we're trying to cluster those and find that better. Um, more tools like that would be very helpful. MJO tools. No, I think Tim covered most, uh, many things. Well, if I'd like to have one more thing, there is not, not a good tool at this point that how can you map your, your local special collections metadata to whatever ontologies that you would like to make it available on the web, such as schema.gobic frame or something. So there is one tool that helps you to map your local metadata field to the context that you are going to use. But I don't know what kind of... It would be hard to write a general purpose tool, but bigger one that could help a little bit. It's a very manual process it is. right now, and that's a challenge. Um, very you know, iterative. The yeah. other thing that we noticed in the content DM application itself is the difficulty in attaching URLs to string values. There's not a really clean way to do that. That, I think, would be the first step that would be very helpful for the data um, because, you know, in Mark, now they're talking about making use of stuff field zero. There's controversy about that, but it does work pretty well for a lot of cases. PCC is moving that direction. So at least there's a way to attach URLs, URIs, really. Um, we need more tools that allow that. And then the other thing is how do you deal with the fact that there may be multiple URIs, multiple URLs, realities? We're trying to find a way to integrate triple stores to make that easier for us, but that's obviously a challenge too. But another, the one thing that Content DM helps us to mapping from metadata field to schema.gov is local specific names. 
because that includes very uh, contextual information such as play title and, and the location of the play and so on. So it is easy for us to how to map those specific field names into schema of semantics. So in our next TF, I didn't show anything on next TF at this point. Um, we are using it for gold proofs. We aren't as far in that, that particular collection yet. But the way we're using that is we actually have these inherited as essentially note cards that have been transcribed into TEI, if you can believe that. They already use some features of TEI for name authority. Um, and we now have been able through specialized style sheets already created for that collection to, um, to use that authority records effectively. And then we've already had some services to help users search on names and then find all the references in this collection of material about Proust and his works and his letters. Um, XTF is very extensible in terms of the work that the XLTs and style sheets do for you. Um, at the moment, we think we're going to be able to take advantage of that to do the customizations we want to do. But I won't have any report on those for another three to six months, probably, um, because of the work coming forward on that. And since those uh, collection is based in TI markup, that uh, some of the elements are locally developed. So that would be uh, another challenge for us to map. Yeah. I'm not sure how generalizable our solution will be for that. I have no idea if anything we're doing will feed into the content DM development. We have had good conversations. We know somebody from OCLC who's agreed to sit on our advisory board, so he will hear about what we're doing um, and maybe give us some comments and feedback. Um, so I think certainly we're providing input. Um, in terms of where content DM or OCLC wants to take content DM, this becomes a question as to the kind of things we're doing, whether they make sense. Locally, we have a number of initiatives going on on digital repositories in general. And so I think there are people here within our system that are thinking, well, maybe we have to go to something else longer term. We're a big enough university to maybe be able to do that. It's expensive to have your own system. But if we can generalize it across things that are now using different off-the-shelf systems, it may be worth it. So I mean, we're doing this in content DM because that's what we want to do. That's what Mellon saw as a good adaptable solution. But um, uh, I'm not sure what the future is going to hold. And I would hate to commit one way or another. And our experimentation is not about the content DM, but the special collections that are uh, reside in content DM. So it is not actually, we don't want to marry them together yep. with the content if DM. It can be, if we can do things that are useful for the content DM, organizations, great, but we're mostly worried about getting the meta right yeah. and getting the displays right. And trying to get an assessment, we're going to do another round of user interviews next spring and see did anything we put in get used? Yeah. Do people really care about some of these extra links and context? Um, are they really helpful? Do they follow these links? We have Google Analytics and some other methods to find that out. So because there's a cost here for libraries, is this valuable enough to maintain? One reason we got Melbourne funding for this was because our library couldn't underwrite it, this project on its own. We needed some help. And then we maybe we'll come back a year from now and say to our director, this really has been picked up by users a lot. You need to do it for our other 10 content game collections. Yeah. And you need to do it on our time because it's useful enough. And if we have evidence that's useful enough, they will say yes. If we don't, you'll say no. But one thing that I can I can think about the content team can do is to support your uh, save your eyes into metadata field because if a content team can allow that, then everything about the the linked linked open data project work is going to be very easy for us in our end. Well, I hate to cut off such a rich discussion, but we are out of time here. I want to thank MJ, Jacob, and Tim for their time. Uh, perhaps you can come back in the spring and tell us a little more about what you've learned and what you think the future directions are. Um, as you've noted, this is expensive and time-consuming work, so thanks to you and the Mellon Foundation for bravely uh, paving the way. 
this webinar has been recorded and I will send out links to the slides and the webinar after, uh, as soon as we can get that converted. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Bye-bye.